The Belgian hospital uh, cut off the woman's cervix and paralyzed her sister-in-law. Her name is Ajima Ogbole. She desired to birth a child, but that desire was cut short when a surgery went wrong at a Belgian hospital. Now, rather than helping her get a baby, doctors at AZ St. John Hospital amputated her cervix. Her sister-in-law, Susan Ogbole, stepped in to act as a surrogate, but she became crippled after giving birth at that same hospital. Now, Ajima is unable to ever carry a pregnancy and Susan may never work again. Here's your story in 10 minutes. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ajima Obole and uh, this is Susan Obole, my sister-in-law. In 2017, I came to visit a doctor in this hospital because I had uh, my husband and I wanted to have a family and after checks he said I had fibroids and he would advise that I had a myomectomy. That's the surgery to take out the fibroids before I, we could begin to start trying to conceive. Um, so we agreed and in November of 2017 I went ahead and I had that surgery. Uh, everything seemed okay. It was a laparoscopy, so I was cut open. He said it was better because of the locations of the fibroids and everything seemed fine until we came back for a checkup and he said he couldn't find my cervix. Asked us to come back uh, a while later so he could put me under anesthesia and try to find the cervix, which we returned with my husband. And when I woke up, I saw I had four holes on my tummy and uh, I was wondering if it was the IUD because he was supposed to put the IUD because he felt my cervix was blocked. He later came in to tell us that um, he couldn't find my cervix and so he did perform the laparoscopy. And as such, uh, he was going to transfer me or refer me to KU Louisville to a professor in gynecology, which was one of the best to recreate my cervix. We went to KU Louisville and the professor told me that for the purpose of a pregnancy, a cervix has never been recreated. And he hopes for my sake that there was a little hole in which uh, my period will be able to flow out. He performed some um, investigations, did ultrasounds and all to see if um, he could see my cervix, but he couldn't and so he ushered my husband and I back into his office. And he said a cervix has never been successfully recreated for the purpose of a pregnancy. He explained to us that the cervix is a muzzle which holds the weight of the baby until you're ready to push and then the baby comes out and also it protects the fetus from infection. He then told me that I could not get pregnant naturally or artificially because the connection between the vagina and the uterus was gone. It was at that point we realized the intensity of the situation. My husband and I then traveled to Nigeria and consulted another professor in gynecology and another fertility specialist, which all advised our best option was surrogacy. Uh, we came back to Belgium. After returning back to Belgium, uh, we had an appointment with another professor in University of Ghent, who is a gynecologist but specializes in reconstructive surgeries. We saw him and he offered to perform a surgery, but it was going to be 20% chance of success. And by success, he meant to recreate the whole and not for the purpose of getting pregnant. If that was successful, then we would start to try to conceive, which I agreed and I had a laparoscopy again somewhere in August in 2018. After the laparoscopy, a catheter was put for 10 days and then we went back, he removed the catheter and then uh, we came back two weeks later for an IUD to be inserted. I was put under anesthesia and by the time I woke up, his assistant came to inform us that the surgery wasn't successful. We started to research the process of surrogacy and what it took. We found out our best option was America, but then we couldn't afford it because it was expensive between one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars. My sister-in-law here, who is Susan, was then coming to Belgium to study and so she offered to be our surrogate. She was resident in Belgium. It was already easy for us because for you to be a surrogate in Belgium, you had to be legally resident in Belgium. So when she came, again, we started to look for hospitals, but no hospital will take us. And we came back to EZ Senyan in Bruges, which my error was made. And after embryo creation and a week to the embryo being transferred in Susan, the hospital backed out.
and said they wouldn't be proceeding and no reason was given. So we decided to go back home to Nigeria to have an embryo transfer, like create IVF treatment and then an embryo transfer, which we did in the first week of February. And then we moved back to Belgium and Susan gave birth to our beautiful baby girl, Imani Obolis Petel on the 15th of November, of October this year, 2018. 2020, sorry. But listen to Susan's part of the story, it even gets messier. Hi everyone, my name is Susan Obole. I am, um, I had the baby on the 15th of October, 2020. Um, I opted for a caesarean and I was told I have to take an epidural because I wanted the general anesthesia and they said, oh no, in Belgium you have to take the epidural, which is safest. So I reluctantly obliged and I signed the consent form because I did not want any complication or anything to happen with the baby. So I I went in to the theater and I was I was administered the epidural, but in the process of the epidural, I felt pain on the left side of my of my back and I kept telling the doctor, Oh, I feel pain and she says she, she kept telling me, Oh, just be calm. I'm trying to get the good spot and she kept twisting I don't know what she was needle. twisting, whether it was the needle or there was something else attached to it, but it felt like a round device or something and she kept twisting and twisting and she kept telling me, Oh, just be calm and at some point she actually found the point she she claimed she was looking for and I didn't feel the pain anymore. So the surgery was carried out, it was successful. But after I got back into the ward, the following day I I was told the epidural um pump had to be removed. So they removed the pump and at about eight o'clock I was able to sit. Everything seemed normal but my legs were having spasms but i was told it would it would wear off and then later that day in the evening it all went south and i couldn't feel my legs anymore a lot of doctors came um they had to look for a neurologist to come and check she came and checked and said i have to go for an mri i have had four mris already the first two they said oh we didn't see anything but the third one they said um, I had to have a lumbar puncture and I was taken for a lumbar puncture and they came and said they saw a bacteria but they don't know what the bacteria is. One of them even suggested, oh, maybe it's a disease from, from Africa, maybe tuberculosis or malaria or cerebral meningitis and they carried out all the tests and they didn't see anything mm -hmm. in my system. So the question was, where did the bacteria come from? Mm. Was it in the process of administering the epidural, it entered my system as a result of them not scrubbing me very well? Or is it that the person who administered the epidural did not know her job? Or the instrument they used was not properly sterilized and up till now nobody has given me an answer. I have partial paralysis from my waist down. I can't pour on my own, I wear a diaper. I can't be on my own. I have to use a catheter to take out the pee. It's been so difficult. And I asked for an apology from the anesthesiologist and she said, oh, it's a complication when we had a meeting with the team of, with the team of doctors that were all involved in the process. So now I have decided that justice must be served. AZ Sentian in Bruges has done me dirty I, 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 I was supposed to go home to see my children on the 30th of November and all to no avail because I'm sitting in a wheelchair. I can't go home, I can't see my family. So I need justice. It is important to add that nobody has apologized to us. After the meeting we had with them three weeks ago or four, the neurologists haven't even stopped by Suzanne's room. Like, it's just after we realized all this, they brought a rehabilitation doctor who is a black doctor. And for us, why? I feel they dragged him into this for damage control. And also, how can two family members of the same race 
have two rare complications in the same hospital. Was a resident also used during my surgery? How can they ruin two lives of two sisters and nobody is showing any remorse? Nobody feels like we, we deserve an apology. We feel it's, at first we thought it was subtle racism, but it's not even subtle. It's real glaring racism. Nobody even comes to us. They feel that maybe we're asking for too much. We, 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 yes, we deserve that. If we were a family member of one of these doctors, they would have gone above and beyond. Her file was supposed to be sent to UZ Ghent. We kept on pushing. It was sent after a week. We kept on asking them, have you referred, have you consulted other doctors to find solutions? Have you done this? They say, no, can they do it? How can you ask a patient? I remembered with my case, I was referred immediately. Why are they claiming based on European laws on privacy? You can send inquiries without even disclosing the patient's case or the issue. The anesthesiologist said she will, they will not apologize because they didn't do anything wrong. If they did, in fact, they kept on saying they did everything perfectly. If everything was done perfectly, why is my sister-in-law on a chair? Why? We feel that this hospital deserves to be investigated. Everybody that has done us wrong deserves to be called to book. We deserve a trial. We will not let this go. We will fight it. Yes, we're Africans, we're Nigerians, but we did not come to Europe on a boat looking for a better lives, life or better lives. We are both from educated family and comfortable homes. So they will not take us for a ride. Like if they've done it to other people, they will not do it to us. We will fight this. We will fight this and we'll make sure the whole world knows of the injustice that was done to me and my sister-in-law. You just listened to the voice of Ajima Ogbole and Susan Ogbole you know, sharing their ordeal at a hospital in Belgium while trying to go through a surgery and to have a baby. We'll take a break here to hear from them when we return. You're welcome back to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. A final conversation would be with Ajima Ogbole. You just heard her story on The Breakfast and she's joined us now via Zoom uh, and she's in Belgium. Good morning, Ajima. Thanks for joining us on The Breakfast. Uh, good morning and thanks for having me. It was very sad and shock shocking hearing your story, you and your sister, Susan. I, I want you to tell us how this has affected you, your mental health, and how it has affected your sister and your family generally. I can't even, you know, put into words or describe how, how this has been and how it has cost us emotionally, psychologically, physically, you know. Uh, the hospital took away my ability to be a mom and now they are taking away my, my, my ability to fully be present and, and take care of, of my child because I'm not even in an emotional, you know, place to be able to do that to the best of my ability. I'm, I'm trying to, to be the best mom that I can be. Uh, also, how can somebody sacrifice so much to give you such an amazing and the most beautiful gift in the world that you could ever ask for, you know, free of charge and, and this would, would happen to her and you would expect that based on our, the history of all my history with the hospital that they would make sure that everything was done perfectly to ensure that there isn't a repeat of 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 of, of a different or another another mistake or or things like that but that that didn't happen uh, my sister-in-law is still in the hospital we were able to move her to a different hospital and it hasn't been easy she hasn't seen her kids since last year february when we were in Nigeria for the embryo transfer. And it's been over a year now. They are three and, and five years. Uh, we requested an essential family visa for them to be able to visit, but the Belgian government, uh, Ministry of Interior and Foreign Affairs plus the embassy in Nigeria denied the, the kids the visa, claiming that they would not leave Belgium, even after the hospital to see my sister-in-law and, and the family needs, well, she needs her family here to be able to, you know, to, it, it will help in her healing process and her, her mental state. 
Uh, they denied us even when our lawyer tried to contact them. They, they, they said in their mail to us that even giving my brother her husband a one month visa to visit was, was a favor done to the family and we should, uh, we should be grateful. All right. we, we feel that that is insensitive, that is wicked and that is inhumane and unacceptable. All right, I do uh, not. So um, that's um, part of some of the things that we have to deal with and are currently dealing with. All right, so I'll, I'll start by uh, saying from our end, uh, sincere apologies uh, to you and to your sister and, you know, to the whole Obole family for um, all that you've had to deal with in the last, um, you know, one year plus. Um, we hope, you know, that, you know, this conversations eventually lead to, you know, justice and, um, you know, some level of maybe compensation that you seek. I'm sorry, um, I can't hear you clearly. All right, I'm saying, you know, on our end, we um, uh, say, of course, a big sorry to you and to your sister and, and the whole of your family for what you've had to deal with um, the last one year plus. Um, I, I, I want to ask about the presence of the Nigerian in, Nigerians in Diaspora Commission. Um, has there been any support from the Nigerian Embassy or from NIDCOM itself? Have you gotten any support? Have you gotten any assistance um, to, uh, to your case so far? Uh, with the Nigerian Embassy, we actually called them to inform them of this in December, and uh, then the acting ambassador asked us to send them details, and we were meant to go to the office to see him, but then he had to travel to Nigeria. And uh, we forwarded it to the consular, I think, on diplomatic affairs, but we never had back from them until the news broke out. And they called us to the, invited us to the embassy, which we went on, on, on Monday. And uh, they told us they would see what they can do, but uh, we are the ones who are supposed to lead the story and they will follow behind, which again was, was very disappointing. Um, they said they would write to the Foreign Affairs Ministry in Belgium and they would try to contact them, but again, uh, it will take a lot of time. And uh, we, 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 they asked us to advise them on how to go about, about the case. And... Uh, and we should lead and, and they will follow, which, which I found very, very funny. Um, Ministry of uh, the, ministry, the um, Diaspora, uh, I think, uh, Ministry, uh, we, we actually gave a letter in the embassy and they acknowledged copying the Ministry of Justice, Foreign Affairs Ministry and the Nigerian in Diaspora Commission. And so we hope that they would be able to pass that along okay. to them and hopefully you know, uh, the Nigerian government will come in and, and help us in our fight for, for justice. Nobody deserves to go through what our family has been through. Nobody. And uh, so, yes, we're pleading to, 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 to Nigerians, the government, and every, anybody who is in, in a position to help, to please help us find justice, not just for us, for people who have come before us and have been silenced, for people who are coming after us to make sure that they don't have to go through or deal with what my family and I have been through. Okay, so Ajima, reading your story and listening to you explain what happened, you had fib fibroids and they said that was one of the reasons why you couldn't you know, have a child. So you went for a surgery at that hospital to remove the fibroids. And in the process of doing that you know, surgery, the doctor removed your cervix or, you know, they said it was blocked. And according to, you know, the doctor-parent relationship, uh, you know, a doctor should not perform a surgery on you or on, on any patient without the patient's con consent. So that was already breached, right? So right now, you've explained that the hospital is refusing to take responsibility for the errors they committed, both with you and your sister. So what are you demanding of the hospital right now? What would be justice for you and your family in this case? Uh, first and foremost, uh, we demand an apology. We, we would not take anything short of that. Uh, secondly, the hospital is still sending us medical bills. So we, we still have to pay medical bills in despite what they put us through. That is unacceptable. They are meant to step in and, and take full responsibility of of their actions. Uh, thirdly, um, we, we, you know, Susan is still going undergoing treatment in a Belgian hospital, a different Belgian hospital. 
And uh, it's fair to say that everybody at UZ Ghent in the validation department have been as, as supportive as they can be. And yes, we're also looking for better options in other places like in America or in, in Switzerland, you know, to enable her, you know, to make sure she gets the best treatment that she can and hopefully get back on her feet. And time is of the essence. We expect that when we find that, that they would come in and, and take full responsibility and, and pay the full medical bills uh, for the for putting us through this. They they they, they, they like Susan and and her needs to be reunited with her family. This the Belgian government needs to do that. It's insensitive to say they are scared that the children will remain in Belgium, and and that is unacceptable. Uh, and, and, and and she needs to be re reunited with her family as soon as possible. They need to take responsibility of their actions. My case has dragged in court for four years. They've put us through so much emotional and psychological turmoil, and they need to end the, the case as soon as possible so that we can move on with our lives. They sent an orthopedic to evaluate Susan's neurological and anesthesiological issue. That needs to to, to, they need to send the right doctors to evaluate to make to 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 um, to, to and and they need to 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 send the right doctors to evaluate the situation and not an orthopedic because I have never heard of of where that is done. It was the same with my case, sending me to an orthopedic to evaluate a gynecological error. If they claim that they want to be fair and right to us, then the right physicians need to evaluate the situation and and. And you know, call it what it is—a medical error or a medical negligence. Well, so this, uh, these are our demands, and uh, yes, we're willing to have a sit down with the hospital, which they've declined, and we need to have a sit down with them. They are currently threatening us to back out from all forms of social media campaign. If not, they are going to sue us, and they should go ahead and sue us. We're not going to back down until they meet our demands. They've cost—they've taken so much away from us. And they can't shut us up. I, I was it, was this a, was this a, a, a is this a well known hospital in Belgium? Who advised that you uh, you know use these you know this hospital at the time? And also, you've described it. You know, one of the things that you mentioned was racism. Why why do you you know see this as racism? I mean, I I'm not particularly saying it's racism. But I, I, I am asking if it's racism because they called it an African bacteria. Until today, there is nowhere in their report which an African, which they have been able to mention what bacteria it is. So what gives them the basis on saying it's an African bacteria? And that's why we're asking questions. We're not saying it's racism for sure, but when you call it an African bacteria and, and, and claim it's a bacterial infection, when my sister-in-law had no no signs of a bacteria infection, no coma, no high fever, no hallucination. And then they also try to blame it on malaria and tuberculosis. So we are lucky that those were not shown in the results. And I told them, we, she has been in Belgium for over a year. I mean, let's not, I would probably test positive to, to malaria. Let's not focus on, on what is not and, what, and, 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 and focus on what it, it probably is. Uh, lastly, the 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 the, uh, the supervising anesthesiologist said that she didn't have her gloves on while the epidural was administered. Why didn't she? An epidural is such a complex um, procedure. It's like probably a brain surgery or heart surgery. If anything goes wrong, then the patient can be ruined for life. And immediately, my sister-in-law started to, to cry for of pain. Why didn't she step in immediately? Why why didn't she have her gloves on? These are questions that need to be asked. Was it that she didn't want to touch my sister-in-law? When a resident is administering such procedures, you should be hands on deck, waiting to step in, should in case you know something goes wrong. But even when she cried for help, nothing was done about it. Hey, Jima, um, just like so again, I leave these questions to to Nigerians and other people to help us answer. What what do you think it is? Okay. Should we you know include race race in it? And well. Ajima, we're, yeah, we we're, we're truly sorry for everything you've gone through. The past two years or more, you've gone through about four surgeries. 
your sister now is not in a great condition. We apologize for what the family is going through at this time. And we hope that conversations like this, you know, can, you know, just like you mentioned, we're leading the story now to get answers and to get justice for you and your family. Thank you very much for speaking with us on The Breakfast on PLOS uh, TV. Say hi to Suzanne. Um, sorry she couldn't join us this morning, but say hi to her and, of course, extend our uh, best wishes to her. I will, and, and thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much for giving us a voice. And uh, we can't thank you enough. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So taking a look at this AZ St. John Hospital in Brussels, they boast of being celebrated as one of the world's leading academic hospital. They say, you know, it's a hospital where every single patient gets basic and very specified medical care. That doesn't seem true in Ajima Ogbole's case and that of Susan Ogbole. And really, we do deserve I'm, answers to the questions we're asking. I am also um, um, very, very frustrated and really, really sad with the reaction of NIDCOM and the Nigerian embassy and, you know, the Nigerian representatives, you know, who should have taken this um, as More their own personal yes. fight. Mm -hmm. I'm entirely disappointed. Um, we hope that, you know, as we continue this conversation, they will be able to you know, shed more light on why they have been so slow so far in taking, you know, this case uh, more seriously. Um, if we don't, you know, treat our citizens across the world, even the ones in Antarctica fishing, uh, if we don't treat them, you know, with all the love and respect and the honor, then I, I don't know what would stop Nigerians from also continuing to leave the country. But we will continue this conversation. Of course, we hopefully during the, the week we would also bring in NIDCOM and bring in other people to speak on this. That's where we wrap up the show this morning. Uh, if you missed out on these conversations, join us on social media at Plus TV Africa, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our social media handles. I am Osaogi Ogbon. And I am Aneta Felix. Have a great day. <laughs>